just there. That might give you then information to make a decision, oh, if I want to go to natural size, I have to turn right now or turn left now. So it's behaviorally relevant. So that really, if you, if you think about uh, representation philosoph philosophically, there are two main criteria. One is that there's information about the stuff that is represented in the code, in the activity. Okay? And the second one that is somehow used behaviorally, that the brain somehow makes sense or makes use of that. Okay? So often in neuroscience, when we observe neural activity, we can't really assess the second one like that, that is really being used, because then we really need to destroy that stuff and see that it really hurts. Um, but with uh, recording, with neural recording or with fMI, we usually uh, want to establish, is there actually information? Okay? And the way we look at information is often because neurons, well, you know, to some degree are linear readouts of these activity patterns. Okay, um, so they, they kind of combine them linear by having a synapse to each of the neurons. Um, you know, at least the first approximation that's true. Um, uh, we kind of restrict our definition of representation. If we can linearly read out some feature from an activation pattern, then we call that an explicit representation. Okay, so that's kind of our working definition of representation. It's actually quite wide, right? So if we say this code represents buildings. We don't mean that there needs to be what's called in neuroscience a grandmother neuron, right? A single neuron that really re uh, reflects natural science and, uh, and one neuron that reflects uh, the uh, uh, you know, what do I, you know, uh, Middlesex College or something, okay? So that's not what we mean. It could be a distributed code, but as long as we hypothetically could read it out linearly, then we say there is information there that can be directly read out and directly used by a downstream region to do something. That makes sense? Yeah? Cool. So that's our definition of representation. And that's what I, you know, when I say representation, that's what I mean. Uh, you know, if I give this talk to a neuroscience audience, you know, by that point, people are like on the barricades and say, like, what do you mean representation? The brain doesn't represent anything, you know. So it's not a, you know, so you need to be very clear about this concept. Anyway, so that's our uh, definition of explicit representation. Uh, features that can be read out linearly so from some patterns of brain. Okay, so here's an example um, uh, from our work. Uh, this is kind of like the hand area of motor cortex. Uh, just to give you a feel for how these patterns look like, um, here are three different subjects. Uh, here is when they move the thumb, the index, the middle, and the ring finger. Um, you can see that the actual patterns themselves look really, really different across subjects. So there's a lot of different variability about how brains represent these things, right? But it turns out that these patterns are always very different from each other. So if we just take two patterns and we ask a linear classifier, can you tell me whether the person moved the ring or the little finger, we can tell that with nearly, you know, 90% accuracy. Okay? 
Um, so we would say that this region represents a difference between the things. Okay, and so this has been kind of like over the last 10, 15 years in neuroscience, it's known as multivoxel pattern analysis um, or MEPA or, or decoding analysis. And that's really quite, you know, that was quite for a long time the state of the art. That people classified these things uh, and then concluded, oh, this brain region represents these things. Okay? Because they could classify or read it out. Now, the, the perspective we are taking now is going kind of one step further and saying, trying to characterize these representations really. Right? Because just having a difference between two fingers or two buildings doesn't really tell you exactly how the brain represents these things. Okay? And that's what we want to learn. We want to learn, you know, we want to learn what is the nature of these representations. We can learn about something, maybe about the information processing in these different brain regions. So the technique that we're doing uh, is basically we look at these activity patterns. So this is uh, so this is kind of how the data looks like. You have a number of different conditions. Uh, you know, maybe different buildings, different fingers, different tasks. And then you have a number of different uh, voxels in fMI or channels, you know, could be electrodes, could be neurons in single cell recording. Uh, and that's kind of what your data is looking like. And what you can do is you can look at an activity pattern, and then you can plot it in a space that now where the axes are formed by the different channels. Okay, so I picked three channels, and so now I'm plotting different activity patterns for different conditions is dots into the space. And if I look only at these three voxels, it turns out that condition one is they're very quite different from condition two and three, and condition two and three just differ by a little bit. And they mostly differ by activity on this channel of voxel. Okay? So this is like one representation of representations uh, that, that is really quite useful. Okay? And uh, it's called, I mean, uh, this is, um, uh, in a way, the way that representational similarity analysis looks at these data, it looks at different activity patterns and then decides, well, how different are these activity patterns to each other? So we come up with some distance measure, and then this would be like a multidimensional scaling plot to visualize these distances. Okay? So let's uh, get an example of this. So this is, uh, I showed this yesterday. This is Matt uh, uh, King's data. Uh, it was very useful in my lab. Um, uh, this is uh, looking at different activity patterns in the cerebellum and how different tasks are represented. Okay? How, how the cerebellum thinks about these different tasks, I mean, what type of activation states they are, and, and uh, the details we can, we can talk about. But, um, you can see that they cluster in a certain way, and that might give us some insight about the features uh, that the cerebellum cares about. So, one example of this, uh, coming back to the campus buildings, um, you know, maybe we find different brain regions that make differences between these different buildings. So we show them eight pictures of campus buildings, or in this case, three pictures. And, you know, you might find very, very many brain areas that somehow where you can read out which building it is. So you can classify which building it is. That doesn't mean that all the brain regions think about the buildings uh, similarly. For example, if you get a plot like this, that Middlesex College is, is further away in a pattern, from Stevenson Hall and the University Building, right? Then what might that representation be? You know? So I don't know if I got the campus geography right, but it could just be, so I, I tried to place these points on a dot like they are geographically arranged on a, on a map, okay? So, so maybe we can think about, you know, this might be a spatial, uh, spatial map of campus, you know, with three regions, with three, uh, with three buildings, it's really unclear. But once you do 50 buildings, right, you can see is this a real map or not, right? Does it respect the normal geography, the normal similarity on the campus map, okay? And so if you see something like this in the, what we call the representational structure, you kind of know that this brain area really represents the buildings in a spatial way, right? It thinks about the spatial way. It's kind of the, the spatial map. And you, you might expect to find something like this in the hippocampus or in the parietal part. Okay, so once you see a fingerprint like this, you could think, yeah, this is really a candidate region for our orientation region. And the prediction would be if you lesion this, then you would be always lost in the campus, which you know, happens to me anyway. Um, uh, good. So, so that's the uh, uh, that's this one. Now, but the representational structure might be look like this, right? It might it might uh, you know 
uh, actually Middlesex College and University Building might be very similar in this brain region to each other, and Stevens Hall might be very different, right? And you know, now we can guess maybe what these two have in common is that they have this uh, tower uh, going up. So maybe this is kind of your architectural region that, that thinks about, oh, is this like, you know, are there kind of big upright things? Um, and then uh, that's very different because it doesn't have a tower, right? So this is really the, 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 the game we're in. So that we now start doing very, very rich experiments so with three with three, uh, um, uh, with three stimuli, you kind of shit out of luck to make any inferences about what's really represented. So you want, you want really rich stimulation of the brain. You want to record these activity patterns. And then you want to look at these structures and try to start figuring out bottom up, but what are really the features that this brain region cares about? And once you have that, then you might make inferences about how that region might process information and talk to other people. So that's, that's really the core of uh, replication analysis. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing a, 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 an experiment like this, uh -huh. um, the, for your other one, the location, um, you would physically need to be in that location for the brain to map it locationally. You just need to recall question. the location. Yeah. So very hard, not having mobile MRI. So yeah. with red fMRI, you kind of shut out of that. So <laughs> what people do in these cases is say, um, they show you the pictures. Yeah. Or they, uh, a lot of people who study spatial navigation as a scanner do the virtual reality, oh. right? So you kind of like, as, you know, they hack into these first-person shooter games, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you walk around in these virtual worlds and pick up objects, and you know, you can you can really nicely decode from hippocampal activity where in that virtual world you are. And of course, it's not quite the same as moving around. So my guess is that you would get much stronger and better and clearer encoding of these things. Uh, uh, but you know it, it does work, and, and so you know, yeah. Okay, so so that's that. So um, uh, so we talked about this representation uh, of the data. So we have this highly multivariate data, many many different conditions, um, and the more the better in a way, and many many different channels. So we get these complex activity patterns, and we can plot it into the conditions, into the space of the actual channels. And this is kind of like that, uh, that project pitch that I did that it's very tricky because obviously this is only a three-dimensional representation of this hundred-dimensional space and you know how do you decide which angle to look at and that's from a data visualization point of view a very important challenge to not fool yourself because like if you rotate this the arrangement might look very different you might come up with very different ideas about what that region represents. So here, so essentially, what you are assuming is that there is a orthogonality between the, the, the values of different variables, right? Uh, so about the e. So when you build up, when you go from conditions, yes. So I made the channel to bottom. Yeah. Right. So because, um, um, yeah. So the channels are are forming axes of the Potter system, right? Often, actually, what we do, we don't quite do that. Um, what we often do is because there is often noise correlation between channels. So in fMRI, this is especially important. In single cell recording, it's actually not that important. You can, you could, in single cell recording, each one is a neuron because each neuron has a voice, and you, you know, they might at least potentially they can dissociate. They can tell us different things. So we just put them on different recording lines. That's how we define our recording system. Now with fMRI, you kind of often measuring two voxels, and they're highly correlated in the noise because they sit on the same artery, got the same artifacts, okay? And so, so one thing that makes these plots much more informative is to do what was called spatial pre widening that you try to estimate the noise correlation, the noise covariance matrix across these channels, and then pre widen the space and orthogonalize in that space. So you have in dimension, independent dimensions after, after accounting for the noise covariance. Um, um, and then actually this distance, this Euclidean distance, is proportional to what the linear discriminant contrast or the, the Fisher discriminant would be. Okay, because that's in a in a pre widened space, the Fisher discriminant contrast is a, it is just the Euclidean distance. So so then in this pre wide space, this gives you really uh, a measure of how well a linear classifier would do to distinguish them. Okay. Um, another way of, of thinking about the data 
is to plot it the other way around, right? So rather than plotting the activity patterns in the space of the channels of voxels, you can also think about the data as each column in this matrix is what we call an activity profile, right? So each one, each neuron or each voxel kind of has a certain activity profile. Often these are called tuning curves, although it's also a loaded term that people don't like anymore. Um, uh, that uh, characterizes that voxel or that neuron. Like, what conditions does this neuron like or this voxel like, and which conditions does it like? Okay? So now you can plot the channels or the voxels as points in the space spanned by the conditions. And you can look at this distribution, uh, you know, the distribution of tuning, basically. And this is the same data. We just look here, we look at it in terms of rows, and here we look at it in terms of columns. Okay? Um, so it's just like two really kind of good intuitions about the data. And what relates the two is basically the various covariance matrix of these things. And that kind of translates from one to the other. Okay? Um, and so uh, there are really uh, three different approaches right now out there. Um, and I won't go into the details of them. This is like just a, uh, just a case that we also have a symposium at, uh, at HBM uh, in, uh, this year in Vancouver um, where we're going to talk about this. Um, you can analyze these representation models with representation of the similarity analysis. That's basically plotting the data in this space and thinking about distances between conditions. So you can do that. Uh, you can look at it in the uh, trying to explain the tuning functions of single voxels with certain features where you say, oh, maybe these neurons like this, like longitude or latitude, or this is kind of like powers with this. Uh, Towards with this building, so you kind of describe the, that that space, the features, and these are then linear dimensions in the space of conditions. So each condition has a certain value of longitude, latitude, and, and tower or not. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, the the one that we kind of uh, work in our lab with a lot, and where we develop the toolbox right now, um, uh, and uh, is uh, to not do this uh, basically linear decomposition, but really describe the distribution of these ones directly. Uh, you know, this, the, the Gaussian models, but you can also do non-Gaussian models, and you can kind of get a good representation of what these, what these tuning functions look like in the region, how they're distributed. And, and really, all these three approaches get at the same thing, right? What is, how are these activity patterns different, and how do these activity patterns relate to stuff in the world? And that's what we call representation. That's, I, I think, is a, you know, uh, despite, maybe it's the wrong way of thinking about the brain, but for me, it's a very kind of insightful way of seeing what's represented and what might happen with that information down the line. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Okay, I have a question, and this is um, this is not my field, but um, anyway, so my um, that's cool. apologies. That's, that's, that's what we yes. um, <laughs> Could there be the option that the kind of that there's no kind of direct relationship between how information is patterned? I'm, I'm in the brain. Could it, could it just be completely a random, or is there strong evidence to show that there is a kind of you can map the um, kind of information on the brain to an actual real life world? Or yeah, so I mean, it's a great. I, I think that's a okay. I'll get to start interpret your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> right. So um, so neuroscience has kind of like this Hubble and Wiesel v one. Uh, so early in early days, um, uh, people uh, in visual cortex, uh, you know, this was kind of what the first Nobel Prize in, in neurophysiology, uh, system neurophysiology, that you know, all of these are stuck electrodes in the visual cortex and figured out, oh, these neurons really are really well described as Gabor. They have Gabor tuning, right? So you to, uh, show them a Gabor patch, like which is a uh, which is a sinusoid dampened by Gaussian. Um, and that's really what they like, that's a stimulus. And you can describe their response properties fully by that tuning curve. Okay, they like a certain orientation, a certain spatial frequency, at a certain location in the visual field. And so each neuron has a tuning curve. So you know exactly what the features are. You can plot that, you can make a 100% a model that is just very simple, very explainable, okay? And so that model, people have applied to all kinds of different brain areas. It's like primary motor cortex. And there's a 20 year discussion now in primary motor cortex. What does the primary motor cortex represent? Is it like movement directions, like velocity, like you know, yesterday in, in Congo Cardinal's talk? Is it muscles? Is it forces? Is it 
maybe something else, right? And uh, you know, the papers are very disappointing, right? The papers that, that take a single feature. They they basically say all these papers read like like we tried this and we tried that, and actually. 25% of the neurons were kind of velocity tuned, 25% of the neurons were kind of muscle tuned, 15% of the neurons were kind of acceleration tuned, and the rest we can't categorize. <laughs> That's really kind of the typical thing, right? And this is why I think the field says it's very allergic against representation. So if you think about representation as being like there is a single variable, like force or velocity or something. And that's what explains the, re the activity patterns in this brain regions. That's most often wrong, right? So brain regions often represent, they don't come with these nice labels that we can think about this way, okay? So often it's a mixture, like brain regions do all kinds of things, and it's a mixture of things that they care about. And that seems to be maximally useful for behavior, right? Ultimately we need to say it doesn't matter for behavior. Um, so, um, so basically, the, the times where we said, oh, it must encode velocity, and let's show that it encodes velocity. Uh, you can show that it's, it encodes velocity better than chance, but it doesn't really explain the full pattern, okay? And so the techniques we are doing is a little bit the other way. We just like, you know, we try to do rich experiments, uh, see what's there, and see much how much these different features can explain of the structure that we actually see. So we can measure how much of the structure is actually reliable, what's there, I mean, you can see the structure. Whether you can make sense of it or not is another case, right? I mean, these features that we put on this, like longitude, latitude, tower or not, these are just labels that we put on it, right? I mean, it's, you know, you know, ultimately this is actually what's, what the brain does, right? Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so I was just uh, curious about one thing with regards to the conditions. Um, I was just thinking that you know uh, when you set the conditions, you, is it, you have to be a little bit careful to make sure that there is, you know, very clear differences between them. Like for example, when you're showing when you're showing the pictures of the you know of the Middlesex College and the, the sorry, the little yeah, one. like you could just visually see there's a lot of blue in both of them. So maybe exactly. So yeah. I was thinking like conditions if you use things that you know are like what you're saying maybe words or. Emotions of that view. It, it feels really interesting to me that you make a certain amount of assumptions that you need because you have a direction, but at the same time you leave it very open so that you can interpret the data. Yeah, I mean the the key, the key thing is like I mean these buildings were just like a kind of a stupid stupid yeah. example, right? Uh, but if you want to do this experiment right and really show that it for spatial location rather than just like low level features. You want many, many different pictures from the same building, from different angles and stuff. And then show, you know, you want to see a region where all the pictures of Middlesex College cluster here and all, you know, in different angles. And, you know, the low level visual properties would change a lot, right? And then, you know, all the ones from Stevens College, so this area of campus would cluster here and all these, independent of their low level features. But, you know, in primary visual cortex, what you would see is that. The amount of blue or the amount of horizon or the amount of building, the vertical stripy energy that is in the building or in the picture, you know, um, that would determine where you are. That would span in these brain regions. So, yeah, to do this, you need rich experiments and not just stupid. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, let's suppose now that you, uh, in the same conditions, you've got two modalities, let's say an I and an EG. Right. Oh, okay. So then now, for each, so if I look at this space where I have the condition, you see that it's exactly the same space, but the conditions are the same. But now, uh, EEG and fMRI data will be represented by two, two different distribution of dots. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So now, how this technique, because you know that people are trying to make uh, the two numbers mm. right? Mm -hmm. How do you think this technique will help? Oh, okay, I think I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, I mean, what people have done, uh, Nico Krieger Scott and so on, that, that uh, has kind of really pushed this field, is to do it in two different modalities. Uh, for example, fMRI and single cell recording. And then uh, calculate the representational structure coming from fMRI and coming from single cell recording, and coming from MEG, and then comparing them across <coughs> modalities. Okay? And kind of what you want to see, ideally, and just make it easy for yourself, is that 
the difference is not that big. And then, you know, actually it turns out between single cell recording and SMI, for this inferior temporal data um, on object recognition, there were stunning similarities between these things. And they were really, really very highly regarded. Meaning, despite the fact that with FMI we sample at this really poor spatial resolution, we get single cells in 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 in, um, in single cell recording, uh, and we get these these even broader things in, in uh, EEG or ECOG. Um, you know, they, they were they were actually quite similar to each other. Now that's not a guarantee that that's always going to be the case, right? Um, and it really depends on the spatial structure of these rest. It's really, you know, very caught in these broad things that we get with my or is it really encoded in the differences between the yeah. But I haven't thought about, I mean, that's interesting, I haven't thought about like uh, merging two modalities. Um, I, I guess you wouldn't want to merge them blindly without knowing whether they tell you similar things or not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that there would be inter individual differences in the way that uh, their representation uh, models would be different. So, two people with different uh, representation models for the same task, because there's obviously uh, uh, different, different levels of spatial uh, ability between people. And yeah, like yeah. I mean, that's a great, I mean, the inter individual difference is something that I really care about right now. Um, so when we look at FMI traditionally with the univariate uh, methods, right, we would have said, oh, this subject looks really, really different from this subject. So if we, if we subtract these activity values, we might find very different things, right? It turns out that in this case, the representational structure is highly correlated across subject. So how your five fingers of your hand are represented in your primary motor cortex is always rock solid the same in every subject. And there are hardly any differences. And we've shown in a paper that that's probably related to how we use the hand in everyday life, because we all kind of use our fingers in a very similar manner. Um, disappointingly, but we would have predicted that um, uh, pianists that sometimes do kind of more awkward things when they especially dissociate the middle and the ring much more than, than we do, that they would actually have a bigger difference in activity pattern between middle and ring than normal people do. Okay? Uh, that hasn't gone out yet. I mean, we, haven't, we haven't really nailed that issue, but we also haven't found it yet. So, um, but you would expect that, and you would expect that meaningful differences in representation um, are really reflected in the representational structure. There was a very nice paper by Tim Behrens, uh, group in Saj Ahabi at Oxford, uh, showing uh, that really, I mean, if you look at, even, so this is a very fine-grained organization, right? This is about a two by three centimeter patch of cortex or so that I'm showing here. Uh, but they looked at like the big activity bands across the whole prefrontal cortex. And you see massive intersubject variability. Somebody lights up for this task down here and somebody lights up from there, okay? Those differences might not be meaningful at all, okay? Uh, because they don't really, you know, I mean, from a perspective of a representation of a readout neuron, it doesn't really matter where the neuron fires, where it tells you it's up here or there, I mean, you know, where, how the chips or how, the, how they uh, are arranged on the CP, on the motherboard is it, really not that key. It's like what's actually the representational content. And so, um, so that's kind of the hope that actually looking at representational structure, we can get an intersubject differences that are actually meaningful and that be able to well then. Because this is like still one of the big things about functional magnetic resonance imaging, right? We've done it for 20 something years. Is it being used in the clinic to predict anything useful? Yeah, there are a few examples, right? Uh, so why is that? I, mean, we, I think we just haven't found the right level of description yet of the data that really tells us something about brain processing and that abstracts over these very different activity patterns. I mean, these, these guys look dramatically different, but when you look at the behavior, they can all move their hand. They all kind of move their hand in the same way. There are no big, I mean, these are non-musicians. Uh, they're all right in this. You know, uh, I mean, there are no, I mean, there are not that big differences between these people. Yeah. Then is it meaningful to show the multidimensional scaling plots on a group level or just repeating 
presumably a very different region. Yeah, you want to, yeah, if you show, if you, you mean, like, do the normal thing. So the normal analysis would just take these patterns across subjects and just average the patterns, right? That's what we do. And then you get an average activity map and it makes an inference. Uh, yeah, if you do multidimensional scaling and look at representational structure, you want to not average across subjects first. You want to take each individual subject, get the representational structure, and then average the representational structure and make the inferences there. Because that's that's the level at, at where we think the invariance across subjects or the meaningful difference across subjects. So that's a game. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. Great. I'm just going to stand here so you don't have to go. I'm going to get more. <laughs> and then, yeah. Happy acting.